Today we will study Deuteronomy 26. Uh, Deuteronomy 26 marks the ending of the laws re-given by God to the people of Israel. From the beginning of Deuteronomy to, to this point, God has been giving laws. If God is to be the God of Israel, they must obey him. And in order for them to obey him, he needs to give them laws. It brings about order. It brings about safety. It's the way in which God's people can interact with God. God knows best. So God lays down the law and it's a law of love and they are to obey it. And in doing so, they honor their God. The last two laws repeated, as we'll read in a moment, are the offerings of first fruits and the third year of tithing. Now, the main point of this chapter is because Yahweh is God and because God is creator of all, God is sustainer of all, God is the sole provider of the entire earth, God is the giver of all good things. As you know, at this time, Israel is now going to inhabit the good land that God has promised them. Because God is God, because God is good, because God is provided, because God is faithful, we ought to respond, listen, by giving back to God. By giving back to God with a grateful attitude and listen, pitch in when meeting the needs of the less fortunate. So really, that's what that chapter is all about. God has been good to you and in return, give back to him. And so then let us read here in Deuteronomy chapter 26. We're going to start by reading verses one to four. And it shall be when you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance and you possess it and dwell in it, that you shall take some of the first of all the produce, which is the first fruit of the ground, which you shall bring from your land that the Lord your God has given you and put it in a basket and go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And you shall go to the one who is priest in those days and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God, that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket out of your hand and set it down, listen, before the altar of the Lord your God. It says here, God is giving you this land as an inheritance. And so one thing we already know, and it's good to be reminded of, is that the land of Canaan was a gift from God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the 12 tribes of Israel. They would inherit, that is, they would receive this precious property after their fathers have passed into glory. That's what it means that it was an inheritance to them. We know that God first gave it to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then they passed, their souls went to heaven, and now this land was handed over to the 12 tribes of Israel. Israel now gets to reap the benefits of their forefathers' relationship with God Almighty. And so in one sense, this great multitude, these people of God, at this point, there's probably over a million of Israelites, got to enjoy this promised land because, listen, God loved their forefathers. Again, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh loved them, and they loved him. And so they were reaping the benefit of their father's relationship with God. And so now they are going to get this beautiful piece of land that was extremely fruitful and lush, beautiful. In verse one, it says there, possess it and dwell in it. When Israel has conquered the Canaanites and have finally settled in, they were to break the ground. They were to till the ground and work the fields and the first fruits of the very first harvest they gathered they were to give that back to God as a way of saying, thank you. As soon as they get there, they work the ground. The very first harvest they get, they give some of that to God. They bring it to God. And all they're saying is, you have been faithful. You have been good. Thank you. It says, you shall take the first of all the produce. Now, the produce in ancient Canaan slash Israel was mainly made up of wheat, barley, 
legumes, which is all kinds of different peas. It's the pea family, figs, grapes, and olives. So we can say that this basket that they were giving to Yahweh was a very tasty basket. But that's what he wanted them to give him. It says there, put it in a basket. Now, when you think about the way we give to God, we don't come and put our offering or, you know, our literal first fruits in a basket. We come and we put our offering in an envelope, don't we? Or we put it in the offering box or or we give it to an online church account. But you can see there that there are New Testament principles. We give to God a little of the much that God has given us. And he says there also in verse 2, to go to the place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name abide. And so there was a place in which God wanted them to bring their agricultural offerings. Wherever it was that God chose, wherever it was that God made his abode. In their case, it was eventually Jerusalem. As you know, the Lord raised up King Solomon and he built the very first temple. And right there eventually was the place where they were supposed to bring all of their offerings, whether it was the first fruits of the field or it was animals and many other offerings that they could give to the Lord freely. At this point, when they crossed into Canaan, there were different designated places in which they could bring their offerings. But eventually, as you know, God wanted them to bring it all to Jerusalem. Today, God has chosen to place his name where? On the local church, on the local Bible-loving, Christ-exalting, Bible-teaching churches, right? God has chosen to place his name on local church houses, and that's where we bring our offerings. At that time in the Old Testament, they brought it to Jerusalem. In the New Testament, we bring it to the house of God, local churches. In verse 4 it says, Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it before the altar of the Lord. We see here that the offerings was given to the priest, and then from the hands of the priest it went to God. And interestingly enough, in the New Testament, we find in Acts chapter 4 and verse 35 and Acts chapter 5 and verse 2 that when they came to church on a Sunday, which was the day that they would come and worship God, the first day of the week, offering collections were brought to the local church gathering. And it says there that they laid the offerings at the apostles' feet. And so just like we see here with the with them handing the offerings over to the priests, we see in the New Testament church, they were giving it to the church leadership for them to distribute the money and put it into the work and the kingdom of God. And so we see that parallel in the Old Testament and the New Testament, the way God still, in a sense, does similar things and in similar ways. Israel gave to God every time there was a harvest. So this was the first harvest that they were supposed to give the first fruits to God. But this was supposed to be continual every year. Every time there was a harvest, the first of it, the best of it, the first that they collected was for God. And it's to be the same for us here today. Those of us who work hard, we choose what we're going to give to God and we give them the best that we've got and we give to God first. That's been a practice of mine for a very long time. This belongs to God first. And so that's what they did. They collected the harvest and they gave the first fruits to God. And of course, they could give to God anytime they wanted to. It didn't necessarily have to be only at the times of first fruits. They were uh, to give to the Lord whenever they wanted. In the New Testament, the pattern of giving to God is found. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians. We're going to read verses 16 and verse 2. And so all I'm really doing here, as you can see, is I'm trying to show you the connection between Old Testament and New Testament giving and how there are similarities. Theologians agree that this verse here is the pattern in which the New Testament church gave on a regular basis. It says there on the first day of the week. Now, what is the first day of the week? Sunday. On the first day of the week, let each of you... You see there that the Lord expected everyone to give. Not only in the Old Testament was everyone to sow and reap, then give to God, but everyone in the local church, even in the New Testament, are called to chip in. It says, each of you. It says, lay something aside. Now, the Lord doesn't put 
a fixed number on what we give to him, a fixed amount on what we give to him. It says lay something aside. Uh, this can be 10% of your income, which is the most common amount given by very few. Uh, this can be, if you want to feel generous, you can give 12% to the Lord. You can give 7%. You can give 5% of your income. There is, again, no fixed giving. The choice is yours. But what does God want from us? God wants us to give to him regularly, faithfully, generously, and with a joyful heart. Really, that's the key. And anything that we do for God, God examines the heart. Are we singing with joy? Are we preaching with joy? Are we evangelizing with joy? Are we giving our offerings with joy? Because really, that's what it's all about. It's about giving to God with a joyful attitude. Then he says here, storing up as he may prosper. In other words, give according to what you make. Obviously, those who have really good jobs, those who are rich can give more, and those who are poor, well, they give less. But again, God is looking at the heart. And so there you have it. If you've ever thought, who came up with the idea to collect offerings on Sundays? God did. 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2. Uh, this is where, again, the church gets the idea of bringing their financial offerings to a local church and to do that weekly. Now, it's not to say that you have to give to God on Sunday. At that time, you know, they couldn't give online and they weren't really meeting throughout the week at some points further on in the ministry. They really did designate Sunday as the Lord's day. And that's just the day that they came. But in reality, we can give to God anytime we want. The point is give to him regularly. When do we give? Whenever we get paid. Right. When did they give? Whenever they got crops. It just makes perfect sense, right? And we know that um, as we give to the work of the Lord, we are able to do more, not just for God's people, but even for evangelism and missions. Really, there's just so many things that uh, local churches can do. Going back to Deuteronomy 26 and verse 3, you shall say, I declare today, to the Lord your God that I have come to the country which the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. So when they gave their basket of goodies to God, they were to also express God's faithfulness in keeping his promises by giving them the land he swore he would. So they were to say God is good and God has kept his word. In the same way when you and I we put aside what we've decided to give God, not giving grudgingly or greedily, but giving with a heart of love to the Lord and his work. When we give to the Lord our offerings, let's keep God's goodness and faithfulness and his faithful provisions towards us in mind. That's what they did. When they gave, it was in connection to how good God has been. How good has God been to you? Does it show in your giving? Really, that's the point of this chapter. They said, thank you for the land when they gave their offering. And we can say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my health. Thank you for my skills. You know, whatever it is that you do in life to make money and put food on the table, those skills were given to you by God. You say, Lord, thank you for the strength you've given me. Thank you for the muscles that I have. Thank him for the car. Thank him for your house. Thank him for your family. Thank him for your friends. When was the last time you just put an offering in the box and said, Lord, thank you for Shine Bright Church? Julie's boy Dylan did that recently. And so we can thank God for our broken country. We can thank God for a drum set. We can thank God for the guitar that he's blessed us with, the piano, the garden that we have. Maybe you have a new laptop. Thank God for that. Maybe you got a chihuahua you love like we do. Thank God for that. The blessings of God are endless, really. And really, that's all God wants from us. He just wants us to do everything with an attitude of gratitude towards his goodness. Everything is to exalt him, right? So whether it's a song or a few bucks or whatever it is, it's to exalt him. 
It's an act of worship. It's, it's saying, thank you, God, for being so good to me, right? Let us read then Deuteronomy 26, verse 5 to 11. And you shall answer and say before the Lord your God, My father was a Syrian about to perish, and he went down to Egypt and dwelt there, few in number, and there he became a nation, great, mighty, and populous. But the Egyptians mistreated us, afflicted us, and laid hard bondage on us. Then we cried out to the Lord, God of our fathers, and the Lord heard our voice and looked on our affliction and our labor and our oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and with an outstretched arm, with great terror and with great signs and wonders. In other words, when God brought them out, he kind of flexed, he showed off. So that way, Pharaoh, the Egyptians and the Israelites will know that there is only one true God. Verse 9, he has brought us to this place and has given us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Not literally, there was not rivers made of milk and Cheerios passing by. This, <laughs> this points to prosperity, a prosperous land. Verse 10, and now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land which you, O Lord, have given me. So beautiful, isn't it? There's so much there. Again, in verse 5, it says, You shall answer and say before the Lord your God. In other words, when you give this basket of first fruits, when you give the first fruits of your paycheck, you exalt God, you talk to God. This is the way they did it. After giving their basket of goodies and declaring God's faithfulness and bringing them out into the land of promise, they were also to briefly retell or recount the story of their long journey and God's awesome plan for his people, both the good times and the bad times. And so they were there just recounting everything that God did. Here I'm putting this basket before you, O Lord, because you have done so many mighty things. You are such a good God. How can I not give to you a little of what you've given me? This was so that Israel would always remember all that God did to get them to where they were. It's good for us to never forget where we came from. It's good for us to never forget where God has rescued us from. Interesting how reaping the land and giving God an offering was connected to, wow, God, you are a superhero. <laughs> you rescued me from the clutches of Satan and hell. For them, it was Pharaoh in Egypt. But it's connected. When we give to the Lord, whether it's a, a song of praise again or an offering, financially speaking, we, we just thank God for how good he's been to us. Like when was the last time you just said, man, I'm so unworthy to give to you. I'm so unworthy to be in your presence. I'm so unworthy to sing among your people. I'm so unworthy that my name would be written in the Lamb's book of life, oh Lord, but you have been so gracious to me. Thank you. You know, I think that's a good, it's a good place to be. Just always reminding yourself that, listen, we don't deserve what we got. This memory of God's greatness produces humility. It produces humility and gratitude, and it may even show up in our giving, our financial offerings to the Lord. Humility and gratitude. Lord, you've been so good. You've shown yourself so faithful and so powerful throughout the years. And as I look back, even in my own life, I see God everywhere. I see his fingerprints everywhere and in everything. It's just incredible. It's incredible how good and gracious God has been. I could stay here all night just telling you of all of God's awesome provisions, left and right, without me even expecting them, you know. God has been so good. God has been so good in every way. Again, verse 5, they say, this is what they have to confess. My father was a Syrian about to perish. Now, this is not saying that the Israelites were Syrian. <laughs> this is pointing to their father, Jacob. Because Jacob, as you know, he was fleeing Esau when he stole the blessing. And so he was in danger. And that's the reason why when it says they're about to perish, they're probably pointing to the fact that their daddy, Jacob, was in trouble. That his brother wanted to beat him down <laughs> for doing what he did. 
But Genesis 24 verse 10 tells us that Jacob passed through uh, Syria there and uh, eventually lived with his uh, conniving uncle Laban, his crooked uncle. When they gave their offering, they were to recall again their slavery in Egypt for 400 plus years. That's a long time. And they were mistreated. God moved Israel from Canaan to Egypt to preserve the Hebrew line, to preserve the Hebrew people. You might say, why did God take them in the beginning, uh, starting with uh, uh, Jacob, starting with Joseph, really, but he took them out of Canaan and he brought them into Egypt because if God would have left them in Canaan, they would have intermarried with the people there in Canaan. And there were only 70 Israelites at the time and it wouldn't have grown to the to the point where it grew. So God had to replant them in Egypt because the Egyptians were racist and they would not intermarry with the Israelites, allowing for the Israelites to prosper and be fruitful and to come out of Egypt with more than one million people. And so all of that was the, the sovereignty and the wisdom of God, right? And so they had to say that. They had to say, God, you know, we were there, we were slaves, but you rescued us and you multiplied us. You've been so good to us. We were just 70. Now we're over a million. We were slaves in Egypt for 400 plus years. Now we're going to own Canaan. Beautiful, prosperous piece of land. This was just God's way of showing them, I am your God and I am good. And I have the power to get you out of anything. And so they were to, again, recall the goodness and the greatness of God. Of course, how God showed up with heaven's power, the 10 plagues on Egypt, how God split the Red Sea. That, too, was amazing. When it says land flowing with milk and honey, again, it refers to the abundant milk of goats. And honey refers to the abundance uh, in regards to dates and the sweet paste that they provided. So when you think of milk and honey, you're thinking of goats and dates. And there was a lot of that. And and those were sweets. That that was their candy. You know what I'm saying? And so God blessed them abundantly in that way. Also means again, a prosperous land. But that reminds me of John chapter 10 and verse 10, right? Where the Lord Jesus says that the thief that is Satan has come to what? Still kill and destroy. He says, but I have come to give life and to give it more abundantly. We can say it's the flowing with milk and honey life, spiritually speaking. That's what the Lord has come to give us. He has come to give us peace with the Father. He has come to forgive us of our sins. He has come to lavish his love upon us. He has come to show us mercy every single morning. He has come to give us the wisdom of God through the power of the Spirit and the written word of God. He has come to make you sons and daughters of God. He has come to write your name in the Lamb's book of life in which he could never be blotted out. He has come to make you kings and priests forever. He has come to bring you out of this world that is passing away onto thrones that will be right next to him in the highest point of heaven. God has not just blessed you with a piece of land. God has blessed you, church, with heaven. And so we've been blessed tremendously. This is the abundant life in Christ. Yeah, we might get persecuted here. Yeah, we might lose for a moment here. Yeah, we might get sick. Yeah, we might get cancer and die. Yes, we might lose our job. Yes, we might lose our home. Yes, we might lose our mind. But we won't lose heaven. And we won't lose our lives, ultimately. That is what it means to have the abundant life. Now, the prosperity preachers will tell you the abundant life consists of the best cars, the best shoes, the best clothing, the best houses. That's nonsense. God blesses his people with good things. But that's not necessarily the abundant life. Because I'll tell you one thing. Some of the poorest Christians in the world, I know some of them. One of them is Joshua and a few other pastors there in India who are dirt poor and are extremely abundant in regards to their love and joy in Jesus Christ. And so it's not necessarily material things that give us joy. It is God who gives us joy. Whether we have or we don't have, we have God. And you can't put a price tag on him, right? He's better than the latest rims, latest shoes. (laughs) Verse 10 and 11. And now behold, I have brought the first fruits of the land, which you, O Lord, have given me. 
Then you shall set before the Lord your God, listen, and worship before the Lord your God. Here we see that we only give back to God a little of the much he has given us. It says there, I have brought the first fruits of the land, listen, which you have given me. <laughs> God gave you your job. God gives you your paycheck. God gives you your breath. And so we just give back to God a little bit of the abundance he gives to us, right? God is extremely generous with his people in so many different ways. And so then Jehovah God gave them a huge prosperous piece of land. And in return, <laughs> they were just asked to bring a small basket of fruit and vegetables to Yahweh. God gives them this beautiful, breathtaking piece of land, extremely fertile. And he says, just, just bring me a little basket when I cause that harvest to grow in your property. That's all I'm asking for. Same thing for us here today. God has blessed us in so many ways, in so many great ways, and all these sayings, just, just give a little back to me. Give a little back to me. And you know, that frees us from greed and it grows us in trust. When you are a faithful giver to the Lord, you are not a greedy person. And you are a person who is full of trust towards God. I trust you. I mean, this is nothing. You, you own the cattle on a thousand hills and the hills themselves and you, you own the earth and you own heaven. You own the universe, you know. I'll be okay, <laughs> I'll be okay. I wanna be generous, Lord. I wanna help with the work. We also see that giving to God is an act of worship. Giving to God is an act of worship. That's what the passage says. And worship before the Lord your God. When you come and you leave that basket full of fruit or that envelope with some cash, it's an act of worship to the Lord. And I think that the worship is namely connected with our joyful attitude. I think that's the worship. That's the worship. It's the heart that you have behind your singing, behind your giving, behind your evangelism, behind all of that. I think that's the worship. God reads the heart. God reads the mind. He says, a sweet smelling aroma that was truly given to me from the heart. Turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. We're going to read verses 9, 6 to 8. But I say, he who sows sparingly, that is, he who gives very little and very greedily will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, there's an agricultural principle. Say you get a farmer. He's got a handful of seeds, hundreds of seeds in his hand. Goes out into the field. And he puts all those seeds out. Because he put all those seeds out, he sowed abundantly, he has a better chance of getting a great return. hundred seeds, maybe a hundredfold, right? But it says here, if you sow sparingly, that's basically saying if the farmer goes out there and he's got a whole bunch of seed, but he decides to just put two down, guess what? He might get two up. That's it. Now the prosperity gospel, they twist it and they just pervert all of this. But in reality, in one sense, God pays you back in the same way you give to him. In one sense, God blesses you in the same way you bless him. So if you're going to be greedy with what you got, then the Lord may be greedy with what he's got. That's just a principle we find in scripture. You hold back, God will hold back. Just like the earth will hold back if you hold back seeds, God will hold back blessings if you hold back obedience. Right? It makes perfect sense. Uh, verses 7 to 8. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. And so this is between you and God. As he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity. Right? Oh, I got to give this to God again. Feels like every day is Sunday, you know. <laughs> or you might have the attitude where uh, you give out of pure necessity. Or you say, well, I'm going to give to God because... Mama needs some new shoes, you know, making deals with God. I'm going to give some money because I need a new truck. 
No, 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 no. You give because you love the Lord. And he might just still give you that new truck. We continue to read here. It says, for God loves a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. If you ever wonder what God loves, God loves a cheerful giver. If that's what God loves, listen, that's what I want to be. <laughs> that's what I want to be. If that's what he loves, you better believe I'm doing it. Because that's what he loves. Right? At times we're really good at doing what he hates. Let's try doing what he loves. Verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always having, listen, all sufficiency, listen, in all things may have an abundance for every good work. In other words, I will provide all of the things you need. And he does that in ministry. When you are generous, when you give to God, you look at your own life and you're like, wow, I haven't had lack in the last 20 some years. God has been good. Everything I need, I've got everything. And sometimes a little more. Verse 11, so you shall rejoice in every good thing. You shall rejoice in every good thing which the Lord your God has given you. Again, God blessed Israel with this abundant land so that they would be happy in the sight of God. Why did God give them the land? So they can rejoice in his presence. They're no longer making bricks under the power of Pharaoh. They're in their own land, working their own ground, giving to God freely from the heart out of pure love to Yahweh. That's freedom. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to rejoice in every good thing that God has given you. God blesses us because he likes to see us happy. God likes to see us happy. You're working for the Lord. You've got an old computer. You need a new one. You've been trusting in God. You've been giving to him faithfully. Eventually, God provides for a better computer. And he sees you smiling, taking that thing out of the package, plugging it in, opening it up, doing something for God on there, maybe working from home, whatever. Everything's to the glory of God. And he sees that big old smile on your face. And you like the smell of that new computer. Gives glory to God. Because you're rejoicing in every good thing. I rejoice in every good thing, whether it's an enchilada or some new shoes for church, <laughs> whatever. The sun rays just beaming on my face in the morning. Love it. Love to see my trees, the flowers bloom. I love to look into the eyes of my wife. I love to see my sons growing taller than me. I love everything that God has given me. I love you. I love you. I love this place. I love what we do for God. I rejoice in everything. I'm a pretty happy guy. I just am. 11. Again, so you shall rejoice. You shall rejoice. You shall rejoice. Turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy. We're going to read chapter 6, verses 17 to 19. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God, listen, who gives us richly all things to what? To enjoy. To enjoy. The little things, church. The little things. God loves to see you happy. He loves to see you rejoice. He loves to hear you whistle and sing, even if it's off key. <laughs> no offense. I, I better keep going. Okay, so... So we are to enjoy these things, not worship these things, right? We know that. Let's keep going. Uh, we're going to read now Deuteronomy 26, 12 to 19. And we're just going to read through it. And I'm going to make a few comments. Then we'll pray to close. Okay, let us read here from verses 12 to 15. When you have finished laying aside all the tithe, of your increase in the third year. Again, this is the year of the tithing. Every third year, they were supposed to gather again the harvest and give 10% of that. And it says here, and have given it to the Levites, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat within your gates and be filled. So now this tithe that happened every three years 
was designated as a kind of welfare system to the less fortunate in Israel. I have the privilege of working a second job, Breaking Bread Ministries. This is a food bank. And uh, what a blessing to see that people still operate in this way in the 21st century, where I get to go to six different supermarkets every week and we collect tons of food and then we get to distribute it to the poor folk in our city. And not everybody's poor, by the way. I mean, some people have money, but then they just have a bad day, bad week, bad month. And so they come for a box of food. But uh, we still see the practice of giving poor folk food, needy people food. It's what God did then. It's what God does now through, through us. It says in verse 13, then you shall say before the Lord your God. Again, they're giving God praise and they're confessing some things that they've done with their tithe. I have removed the holy tithe from my house and also have given them to the Levite, the stranger, the fatherless, and the widow. According to all your commandments, which you have commanded me, I have not transgressed your commandment. In other words, I haven't broken your law, nor have I forgotten them. And then they continue to say what they didn't do with the tithe. I have not eaten any of it when in mourning nor have I removed any of it for an unclean use. In other words, they didn't use their tithe to do something evil with it. God's money, God's provisions to do evil. Nor given any of it for the dead. Now, some of you might be thinking, were they trying to feed dead people fruit and vegetables? No. What happened was in Egypt at that time, the practice was that if you died, that they would bury you with food. Even today in Catholicism, some practicing Catholics, Lord have mercy on them, uh, still give food to dead people, which really is demon worship. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord my God and have done according to all that you have commanded me. You know, I love that. I love that because we should get to the place in our walk with the Lord. Yes, we're never going to get to a perfect place, but come on. There's got to be many times where we can say, Lord, I did what you asked me to do. I did what you asked me to do, and I'm happy about it. And I know that it pleases you. Verse 15, look down, that is, look down with pleasure, from your holy habitation, from heaven, and bless your people Israel and the land which you have given us, just as you swore to our fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, they're just saying it again. You kept your word. This is a bomb place. Very nice, very attractive, very tasty place. We're going to read now verses 16 to 19 to close. Your subtitle may read a special people of God. That's what you are. You may not always see yourself as special and valuable, but you are beyond your wildest dreams in the eyes of God. Verse 16. This day the Lord your God commands you to observe these statutes. By the way, statutes have to do with written laws. And judgments. Judgments has to do with the decisions that the judges make. We can call that justice. And it says, therefore, you shall be careful to observe them with all your heart and with all your soul. Today you have proclaimed the Lord to be your God and that you will walk in his ways and keep his statutes. Again, his written laws, his commandments, that is his charges and his judgments, that is referring to justice again, and that you will obey his voice. And we know that his voice is his word. 18, also today the Lord has proclaimed to you to be his special people. And the Lord does that several times for them. He reminds them, you're, you're my special people. Just as he promised you that you should keep all his commandments and that he will set you high above all the nations which he has made. Listen, in praise, in name, and in honor, and that you may be a holy people to the Lord your God, just as he has spoken. Now you might say, I don't see Israel in that state right now. That's because it will be in that state, in that high elevated state during the millennial reign found in Revelation chapter 20, where Jesus Christ is king of Israel. At that point, Israel will be the most exalted, most honored, most respected, most praised spot in all the world. 
because God in the flesh will reign from there. And so then what we read here is still in one sense to come. Now we saw glimpses of Israel being exalted with King David, the best king that Israel has ever had, of course, below Christ. And then you had King Solomon, where you had the Queen of Sheba, who would come and be impressed by the wisdom that God has given them. And so even at that time, they were very prosperous. Uh, King Solomon was very wise. They were in one sense, a high mountain in the world at that time. But then, as you know, after King Solomon, his sons caused the split between the northern and the southern part of Israel and started falling apart. That went from gold to silver to bronze to dirt. You know. But uh, Christ will bring that golden age back and better than ever before. 